It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more. Care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets. Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia, Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello and good evening, everyone. This is your Black Pro Gen Live Genealogy with Seasoning on a Tuesday night, and I want to welcome you near and far, old and new. So tonight we're going to just jump right on into it. It's your uh, Woohoo Part 2, um, the first and the last episode that we've had. We've had one, our first uh, episode for the year, and this is our second one. So we just want to thank you and just kick back and, and relax and enjoy what our panelists have to offer you tonight and let you see their stories. So with that, my name is True Lewis and I'm your co-host for the evening and I'm going to turn my hot mic over to your girl, Nika Smith, your host. Hey, <laughs> Grandma. Hey, Nika. <laughs> <laughs> I am hanging on by a thread tonight <laughs> and it is so cold. Why is it like snowy and 28 here in Kentucky? It is freezing here too. My cold, my toes are super cold. I don't know. Matter of fact, let's do a temperature check in the chat room. <laughs> just, just post the temperature wherever you are, just so we know that we're not the only ones who are freezing tonight. But nonetheless, let me go ahead. Let's jump right on in, right? Yes. For our final show. Final show, you all. 27 episodes oh, into 2018. Oh. <laughs> when I took the light and the backdrop out tonight, I said, I have done this 27 times. I don't <laughs> think I really counted before now how many we've done, how many times we've done this in one year, but this year is 27 shows. Tonight, we're going to take a deep dive with select panelists as they share how they got to their most crucial research finds live for you, our viewers. Thanks for joining us tonight for How I Did It, part two. If you have a question or comment tonight, we want you to join the conversation now. Participate in the live chat taking place on YouTube to the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, feel free to weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at BlackProGen or use the hashtag BlackProGen. Here is your last reminder of 2018 to set your reminders. All you need to do is head to my YouTube channel and click set reminder under the episode you're interested in or simply subscribe to the channel and you'll get a reminder each and every time we or I go live. If you're tired like we are of seeing Confederate flags, ships, flowers, and the wrong oil paintings as profile images for your ancestors, Black Pro Gen Live is here to save the day with a cape. Download our new icons for online tree profiles today. We're adding new ones all the time, so if we miss something, be sure to let us know. Also, Here's a reminder, we have started a Facebook page and we've seen so many of our faithful fans subscribing or liking the page. Feel free to do that today so that you can get the updates, right? You don't wanna miss out on what we're talking about during the hiatus because if you recall, we are not having a single show during the month of December. That means the panelists get to relax, chill, kick their feet up, drink tea, do a number of different things, right, during the December reset. So just be sure to stay tuned. Of course, we'll be sharing news, blog posts, whatever we can, previous episodes to keep your to keep your appetite wet uh, during the hiatus. Yes, and wine will be on deck as well. There is nothing wrong with good drinking a good glass of wine. All right, panelists, it is freezing in Tennessee, but that's okay. I've decided to be festive tonight in my red, changed my backdrop 
to make it Christmassy. I considered throwing up lights, but I decided against it. We're going to celebrate the holidays tonight on Black Pro Gen Live. Hello, I'm Nika Smith, True Lewis, everyone else come off mute. Let's go with our most tired panelist for the evening, which I believe that would either be a tie between True Lewis or Bernice Alexander Bennett. <laughs> yes, exciting. But yeah, I think Bernice got me. <laughs> She Windy in the morning, yeah. <laughs> but I'm here tonight. <laughs> Hello, yes. everyone. <laughs> yes, celebrating her 49th wedding anniversary. Wow. This crazy woman and her husband decided they were going to go all the way to New York to go to Wendy Williams this morning. <laughs> and then she drove home and now she's going to fall asleep on us tonight. So, Lord, please bless her with good night's sleep. I just, I just thank God she came. We are so grateful that Bernice uh, made it on the show tonight because it was she just slid in the home. Yes. True Lewis is crazy herself <laughs> driving back. That's why I called her grandma because she is a new baby grandbaby. Uh, mm -hmm. this little Miss Everly, who was born, who's now a part of the Black Pro Gen Live crew, Chandler is no longer the youngest. <laughs> Actually, no, it was Renata's <laughs> grandbaby was the youngest. And yeah. Now, now, little Miss Everly is, um, she is no, she is now the youngest of the Black Pro Gen Live family. And Miss True, Grandma True was crazy and drove back from Illinois all the way to Kentucky today because she is a nut. <laughs> Yeah, I just got to stay on schedule, but Nanny will be back. <laughs> Nanny will be back. My, yes. my, my. All right. Heading down to where it is the same, it's the same temperature, the number of degrees as the number of shows that we've had this year. Yes. 27, St. Louis, Missouri, with our beautiful Beyonce-esque tonight, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> Linda Bug Sims. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it's 27 and the show me state, the only city where you can have all the seasons in one day. So yeah. Sunday, <laughs> it was warm Sunday, then it got cold, we had a tornado and then went to snow. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, what's so funny is that we beat you by two degrees here where I live and no kidding. Two weeks ago, I had a wedding that I was photographing on a Saturday. It snowed on Wednesday and the wow. wedding was outdoors on Saturday. So I was like, Lord, them folks going to need electric blankets. We're going to have to have space heat or something outdoors. Do you know it was 67 degrees that Saturday? And it, we'll there be was back up in the fifties. Exactly, weekend. there was snow on the ground <laughs> stuck over to, overnight, and it was sixty-seven on on that Saturday. Not a lick of snow <laughs> on the ground. Ground wasn't even wet. Wow, crazy, absolutely exactly. crazy. And we think we're further down south, and it's not helping. I know. <laughs> I know. It's not. All right, joining us in teal and pink tones, the other grandmother who just came back. Why is everybody on a trip this week? Uh, Renata. Thanksgiving. <laughs> true, true, true. Well, I didn't know there was pink in this shirt, so I was like, <laughs> I think it's, purple. it's supposed to be purple. It might not be coming across right. Hello, everybody. This is Renata Yarbrough Sanders from Newport News, Virginia. I'm a little under the weather tonight, so I might be on the quiet side, but who knows? It might make me loud, Mama. Who knows? It, it might. <laughs> yeah, we, are all, we are all sliding <laughs> home tonight. Let me tell you, because Bernice yep. tired, True tired, you ain't feeling good. It's five degrees with Linda, and they're going to have a tornado in five seconds where she lives. <laughs> <laughs> Going yep. down south to uh, what should have been uh, what should have been the home of Andrew Gillum's, the new senator, but it is not, but we're okay because he's got bigger endeavors ahead of him. Ellen Fernandez Sacco. It's going purple, I'm telling you. This is changing down here. <laughs> I, hey, there ain't nothing wrong with a purple Florida now. No, no. No, Absolutely. not at all. Not at all. Not and at speaking all. of purple, it looks yeah. like she's wearing it, but the last time I, I said this, she told me I, she had on the different color. It's like blue. It's like a gray blue. <laughs> It looks blue to me, Which too. Which one's she talking to? I'm talking about you. Talking about you, Dr. Navy. Shelley Murphy. It navy. purple. It's Navy. It does look purple from here. Yeah, it does look purple. <laughs> it's Navy. 
<laughs> anyway, hello, everybody. Good to be here tonight. All right. Shelly's in the house. Last but not least, Teresa Vega in probably the coldest place, but we'll have to check temperature wise. No, How cold no, is it there? it's 40 degrees. No, oh. and that's not fair because you're the coldest state. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <What> right. <laughs> Uptown near the boogie down. Yep. Yes, yes, we are here. Uh, chat room is cracking off. Hello, Neff Hawthorne. Everybody is saying it's a sad evening. Maybe we need to sing Negro spirituals because all the, the chat room is very sad that this is the last episode of 2018. Oh, we they won't really be too are. far away. I know. They're, they're emoting. They're, they're having positive reinforcement over, over all this. Hello, Neff Hawthorne. Hello, cousin Raymond Reeves. He put he put some um, festivities in the chat rooms. Oh, lots of you know, saying, hello, we're celebrating. Um, Tom Reed said he's going to miss tonight. He's not going to get, to actually, they're going out for Taco Tuesday this week. Um, <laughs> so he is still getting tacos. He just won't be on tonight. Hello, Tom Reed, Diana James Winder. Thanks so much for joining us. Denise Muhammad, we love you. Thanks so much for being such a great viewer. Same with uh, Tyrone Crab. Tammy Ozier, I believe it's her birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Tammy, <laughs> Gary Franklin for Maggie, Sharice Louis joins us, Cecilia Matoyer, Charles, hello everybody, Christine Varner, Deborah Singleton, Angela. Angela, Walton Raji is skipping us tonight because she's too good. She's in the chat. She's in the chat. Mm. <laughs> couldn't, jo <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't join us in video, but that's all right. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you so much. It's 33 in ATL, uh, 38 in Montgomery, 33 in Central Virginia, 40 in NYC, 58 in West Palm Beach, whatever. Big W to you, Tyrone Craft. I don't care. <laughs> 55 in Fairfield. I'm thinking that's California, but that could be another, another Fairfield. We'll see. Anywho, all right, you all, we have a lot of comments or a lot of uh, content to jump into. Oh, Alvin Blake's joined us tonight, Bernice. Look at that. Go ahead, Woodville, Mississippi. We're waving hello. <laughs> um, and Leontini is in the chat room as well. Look, we've got, I mean, people are just, they're just showing out tonight. Oh, we've got boy. so much content to get to. Uh, we've got five panelists um, who are primed and ready to go and to share with you their research findings. Why do we do this show? Because we want to give you hope. And especially going into our hiatus, we want to remind you that it is still possible for you to make research discoveries no matter how long you've been at this. It could be three days or it could be 30 years or 40 years right everybody is continually making discoveries i don't know a single person who has researched every single aspect of their tree and doesn't have to research anything new i don't know anybody who can say that so what we'll do is we'll go from panelist to panelist they're going to answer a few um different questions in particular um What's the most crucial research discovery they've made in their personal genealogical journey or search? And then followed by that, they're gonna talk about what the specific steps they took that led to that discovery. Because oftentimes, even when people are blogging about these things, you folks focus so much on the end result and not so much the steps that it took to get there. And there's a lot to learn in those steps. There may be something they say that may trigger you to think, oh, you know what, I have a document just like that. Or maybe I should approach something that I already looked looked at from that vantage point. That's the reason why they're going to go through the steps. Following that, they're going to talk about why the discovery was a major breakthrough. Because for the rest of us, we're saying, oh, well, this is just a marriage license. Why is that a major breakthrough? Well, it may have been that they it was information they never came across or that no one in their family knew. So they're going to talk about that. They're going to talk about how long it took them to get to the information. Because we're in such a quick you know, society and environment, people tend to think that research does not take long. Ever. And even though we get information much more quickly now, research still does take a long time. It can take a long time. Sometimes it goes fast. So they're going to talk about how long it took to get to the information. They're also going to talk, they're also going to talk about um, what they've been able to do as a result of making the discovery, because sometimes we get we just stop at, oh, I found the license, that's it, right? But there's there if you're really doing research correctly, there should be a plan that gets put into place after you have found that document and then proceeds on. And then finally, they're going to talk about the biggest lesson um, from the experience that they can pass on to others. All right, so the first person up for the evening is 
Miss Sleepy from New York. <laughs> She's going to talk to us first um, about her ancestor, Andrew Kemp. And you let me know, uh, Miss Bernice, when you want me to put the document up. You have to unmute yourself, ma'am. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yes, you okay. are. Okay, hello, chatters. And I'm really happy to share with you all my, uh, my finding and what was significant. First of all, I'm going to talk about my ancestors that are from Edgeville, South Carolina. And you can actually put the document up. Now, I began to search for my living connection to the Kemp family in 2004. I started doing this because I knew that my grandmother's surname was Kemp. However, in my lifetime, I never met any Kemps. So I began with the search by going to a, a site called Afrogenius.com, of which many of you have probably used. Now, going to Afrogenius.com, I identified a person who was also looking for a camp in Greenwood, South Carolina. We connected only to find out that her grandfather and my grandmother were siblings. Together then, we went on this journey to continue to find our ancestors and discovered that our great-grandfather was named Richard Kemp and his wife was named Anna Frazier. Well, we couldn't stop with Richard. I mean, Richard was in the 1880 census, but Richard was also with his father, Andrew Kemp. So we continued and found Andrew Kemp in the 1870 census. Now, as you can see, I'm going on a, a it's kind of sequential. I'm going backwards uh, each generation back. Throughout this search process, I connected with the Old Edgefield Genealogical Society and the South Carolina Genealogy Society. Because when you're starting to do this research, you can't do it in isolation. You want to touch bases with as many people as you can. With the old Edgefield Genealogical Society, I connected with a descendant of a Kemp. And with my entire family, we went to Edgeville, South Carolina, which is a slave owning community, and began to study the community. And through that study, several documents were identified, one of which is the document you were just shown. And that is an inventory in 1847. Caroline Kemp, this is the chattels of, of, of uh, Caroline Kemp who passed away. And my ancestor, Negro boy, Andrew, was identified on this document, as you can see, it's underlined. So this was a very significant find for me because it didn't take years for me to do this. It took, it was a matter of months actually, because once I had this, this trajectory where I was going, I knew I wanted to find as many of my ancestors as I could. Now, as you can see, this is dated 1847, but there's also another document dated 1844 and even another one dated 1829. And in 1829, not only do I have Andrew, I also have his mother and father, Patience and Sam. So can you imagine going through this journey of finding your ancestors enslaved? And as you can see, this is not a slave schedule. This is not a blank sheet of paper with a uh, uh, owner on it and just a Negro uh, boy and a slash. This is actually the name of my ancestor on this document. So this was a big find for me. And I ended up writing the entire story in a book called Our Ancestors, Our Stories. And the title is 
searching for my South Carolina kin. And so this is a document that I wanted to share with everyone and to really encourage you to keep searching, for keep searching for your ancestors enslaved, look for their names. Don't believe this stuff that they didn't have any names. They did have names. My ancestors just happened to have taken the surname of his owner. Okay, and the next question I have um, for you is, what's the, the biggest lesson out of this? I, I have that question that you can pass on to other people. And um, what have you been able to do that you mentioned that you wrote a, par a part of a book, right? Yes. Um, where you talked about this. So what else have you been able to do as a result? You talked about how you were able to go back another generation looking yes. at documents. What other things have you been able to do I've as a result? I've also found other, other kin folks. I mean, one of the things about finding your ancestors enslaved is that they did have siblings. He had several siblings. And so that's finding information about his siblings. You know, I do know that his he had a sister named Patience. I know he had a br brothers and all of those individuals were on the inventory and they were in the 1870 census, which means that allowed me to start looking for them and to start looking for kin folks. So you don't just stop with your immediate ancestor. You go wide, you go up and down, you search as much as you can. Especially, you know, I definitely want to hit on this, especially when you're doing DNA research. We, I always talk about how you need to go up, out, and down in terms of your research. You can't just focus on your direct relations up and then the, you know, their descendants. You have to go out to their descendants because the DNA for these folks is going to be in your DNA if it's a close enough relation to you. Or if you have a situation where people intermarried and the DNA gets preserved, the older DNA gets preserved. The other thing I also wanna point out about this particular um, inventory is that this was not a very wealthy person. Um, that's something that sticks out to me, right? Because I've seen, I mean, and I'm sure you've seen other inventories where there was more than just a woman's saddle for $5, a chest for $3, a bed and furniture for 20. And the most valuable thing on this, on this inventory was your ancestor. Well, it, but her father had a lot of money. You see, mm. he, he belonged to someone else because there's even more to this inventory where he then is sold to someone else. Mm. Uh, but let me just tell you something. One thing about this particular inventory is that we discovered that the, the siblings were based, they stayed within the family. And there was a price tag associated with each of the siblings. They did not leave this camp family structure. And that's how I think it was easy for us to, to find them, find all the names in 1870 and then find the same people or at least the same names in 1844. So it, it is important though, as you said, to research up and down and across because DNA is something that you definitely want to connect with. And of course I did take the DNA test and of course my cousins, we did match. So it, it really validated everything that we did from the paper trail perspective before we did the DNA. And, you know, I always tell people DNA is good, but DNA without genealogy and history is incomplete. It so absolutely you have to is. do it. You have to do it all. So the, the other thing to wrap up for you, and then we'll go to viewer questions and panel questions is um, what's the biggest lesson you can pass on to others as a result of this experience for you? Uh, don't stop. Keep digging. Go local if you have to. I went local first. Now it's online. It wasn't online when I started. Many of you will have to go local, go into the courthouses, contact the genealogy societies in your community and connect with the descendants. The descendant knew who we were because they had the records. They saw the information. So I would say certainly try to reach out to the descendants of the slave owners because they may have the valuable piece of information that you're looking for. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. You're next. Welcome. Next. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. All right. Moving on, our next presenter is going to be Teresa Vega. Let me go ahead and get your window up so you can talk a little bit about Laura Thompson Green and George Green. Well, I I, I have a lot of significant findings, but I focused on my second great grandparents because they represent um, the unification of two early black abolitionist families in the tri-state uh, area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And then over on the right, um, we have the Jacob D. King Underground Railroad House. So about 20 years ago, I started my genealogy search. Uh, the past 10 years, I've been searching, researching with my cousin, Andrea. Um, and we've made all sorts of, of, of findings. So 10 years ago with Rand Andrea's help, we, we did traditional genealogy, looked at census records, city directories, Dutch Reformed church records, um, uh, uh, regular church records, uh, newspaper articles, et cetera. Uh, we had like four, I would say four breakthrough documents. One was the 1850 census record for my third great grandfather, Cato Thomas, uh, Thompson and his wife. Uh, that listed his mother as being uh, Ann Thomas Thompson. And she was uh, 82 years old. And they described her as a black woman born in Holland. Um, on that list, uh, we've had other black progen episodes with the fan principal. Uh, we noticed that Jacob D. King was living right next to Cato. Come to find out Jacob D. King was the husband of my fourth great aunt, Cato's sister, uh, Catherine. Um, and the funny thing is growing up in Massachusetts, we have cousins that we were raised with. Uh, they're my Meyer cousins, Washington cousins. And for years we knew we were cousins, but we didn't know how we were related. Turns out they're direct descendants of uh, Jacob D. King uh, line. Uh, and they go back to the Vanderseys, think uh, our, one of our distant cousins is James uh, Vandersee. Uh, another critical document was my second great grandmother, Laura Thompson's widow pension. Uh, one of her witnesses was Mary Louisa Green um, Butler, who happens to be the daughter of Howley Green, who also had our second underground railroad house in Peekskill, uh, New York. Um, both, uh, 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 Mary Louisa was, was, uh, married to George Butler. He was part of glory 54th regiment. Uh, they left Peekskill and ended up in Newark, uh, with a sojourn to Baltimore, but that was how we figured, wait a minute, something's going on here. Then the third document I would say is significant was the will of Lazarus Hetty Jr. Turns out his sister was uh, Sarah Dungy, who, who married Reverend John Dungy. Their daughter was Rosetta Dungy, who married, who was the second wife of my third great grandfather. Rosetta had a sister, Nancy Dungy, who married Reverend John Ware, who gave us our third underground railroad house in uh, three places, Upper Canada West, uh, Rochester, and Buffalo. And then I would say the fourth uh, critical document was the 1850 obituary of Lazarus Hetty Sr., where he mentions working for Benjamin Lyon of uh, White Plains. Now, Benjamin Lyon links up with, he's a descendant of our European Lyon side. And on that side, we have two other Underground Railroad homes, the Thomas Lyon Jr. House in Greenwich, uh, Byron section, and also in Port Chester, the Bush Lion House. Um, the real breakthroughs came in with DNA, and we took our uh, both uh, 23 and Me DNA test and then a FTDNA full sequence test after that one. And that's when Andrea, we share the same second great grandparents, but she's a matrilineal descendant of Laura. And uh, uh, she came back M23, which gave us ties to Madagascar. Um, 
so we definitely knew uh, uh, Malagasy roots are, are there. But when upon further uh, looking at our DNA cousins, turns out we're direct descendants of some of the first uh, Native American, um, Afro-Dutch, um, Malagasy, West African families going back to New Amsterdam uh, on our Native American side since forever. On our African side, we can trace back to Paulo, I'm sorry, Emmanuel de Angola, Angola, 1620. Um, our DNA breakthrough also confirmed our genetic ties to the lion family. Um, and then uh, we, we've been working with our lion cousins. And, and as I said before, we've confirmed our um, ties to uh, uh, their white abolitionists. I'm not studying my direct uh, line. I'm studying uh, uh, a different lion line. So when you look at collateral relatives, definitely do that. And then through oral history, we have a cousin, Pam Neville, who had oral history that her third great grandfather was, was a loyalist, ended up in Nova Scotia, then ended up in Upper Canada West at the behest of John Graves Simcoe, a, notice, a, a notable anti-Native Americanist, and, but who was also an abolitionist. And through our traditional genealogy uh, sources, we've found out that our ancestors on the Lion Green Merit side were both uh, loyalists and uh, patriots. And when you go back to some of our connections, going back to Monmouth County um, and also to uh, Northern New Jersey, you see that we are, are we had ancestors who were on the last uh, uh, black loyalist ship out of New York City Harbor in 1783. Um, one of the best things that we've learned is that um, through, I've been able to map a migration trail where our folks started in New Amsterdam, moved to the Tappan Patent, from Tap and Patton, of course, our folks were from mixed status households, slave for lives, slave for a term, and free blacks. They, through DNA, we can move from Bergen County to Orange Rockland County, New York, to Ulster County. From Ulster County, we go up and down both sides of the Hudson, and then we skip over to uh, New Brunswick area. And from New Brunswick and Middlesex County, we end up in Newark uh, uh, right after the uh, American Revolution. So DNA offers a lot of clues. Um, my advice to people is uh, never give up. You, you have to, as Bernice said before, you have to hit the paper trail. I am one of these people who encourages folks to dig deep. And when I say deep, I can I go to every local archive I can go to. I hit the libraries. I go wherever I need to go. Okay, I I devour books. Um, one of the things I will say that say is that when you deal with um, uh, DNA, uh, you you have to keep an open mind. You have to triangulate. You you have to go back and forth. Look for the largest story. Our stories are out there. Do not get caught up in people who don't respond to you. Work with people who want to work with you. Work with people who want to share with you so you can build that story. Don't get caught up. Uh, these people don't contact me. Forget about them. They're unimportant. Um, expect the unexpected. Okay. I approach these archives. Sometimes I, I have a plan. I, I look before I go. I know what I'm looking for. Sometimes I just walk up and say, ancestors, please be my guide. And I just go in and search whatever. And I've found a lot of things that way. And, and understand, um, if, if you're like me and you have a, a, a roots, early roots in the North, there's a paper trail before 1870. There's a paper trail. And so you, you have to be willing to expect the unexpected and, and realize that oral history is oral history. But if you can back it up with proof, try to back it up because the records are there. There's no such thing as ancestor ownership. Uh, ancestors 
have many descendants. So be aware that when you're reaching out to people, you know, do what you have to do. Uh, 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 tell their stories. Um, one of the biggest things that I'm writing about now is my my latest blog post where I'm going to be discussing the issue of that we don't talk about as much, which is early African American endogamy. I can go back to Middlesex County based on the research I've been doing for the past five years on our mtDNA test. And you wouldn't believe everybody can tell us about Mayflower descendants, Jamestown. People forget that among early African Americans, whether North or South, in these small communities, who else were they going to marry but other African Americans? When you consider that in Newark, 1800, in Newark in 1800 was all of Essex County, there were only 300 African Americans, not 300 African American families, but 300 African Americans, when families could range anywhere from six to 16 plus children. So what I've been able to do in, in the biggest um, um, recent find is be able to look at and triangulate my DNA cousins. Um, two years ago, I wrote the DNA trail part two and, and I surmised um, some of the surnames. And lo and behold, I'm now able to look back and see that uh, knowing that we recently came, uh, uh, thanks to Calvin Shermerhorn, we, we got the last slave ship manifest on October 25th, 1818. And one third of those names we can trace back to surnames in our family. Okay. So uh, I, I, I keep digging, don't stop. Uh, and then make your ancestors' stories public. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Share your research um, with other archives who may not have it. Um, share it with your family, just share it. We have a responsibility to to write our ancestors or, or say their names back into existence. So I want to make sure people do that. Don't keep it to yourself. Our stories are out there. It's it, They're hidden and we need to shine a light on them. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to call uh, attention to one of the images that you sent over um, mm -hmm. that was part of uh, some of the documents that you gave me, which this one kind of stood out to me. Um, this oh. one, uh, it says, many slaves were concealed under the floor here. Garrett mm -hmm. Rogers examined um, an opening. His grandfather, although born in New Jersey, was enslaved. And so this was at one of the homes that Teresa referenced this, in terms this is of part of the, the Underground Railroad. Yeah, well, um, let me add something, Nico. Um, Jacob D. King was a cooper. His brother, Abraham, was a carpenter. His brother, Reverend John uh, A. King, was a plane maker. My third great-grandfather who lived next door was also a carpenter, and he was probably um, uh, 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 learned the trade from them. But my fourth great-grandfather who lived right next door was the first stagecoachman. And he was also helping out on the Underground Railroad. And that's a legitimate, this this, this is a legitimate house. Uh, Rutgers, uh, as an FYI, Rutgers, downtown Rutgers built over uh, that um, uh, house. And however, this coming year, they're gonna be uh, uh, paying tribute to Jacob D. King. All right, next up is Renata. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Oh, actually, no. I'm sorry. I thought it was. I thought <laughs> I it was. Yeah, I was going to say sorry. <laughs> I, was Sophie, I was getting Sophie, and, and don't ask me why I was getting Sophie and Calvin and, and his boo confused. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I was. I just did my bad. Y'all, We I told y'all we sliding into 27th episode. <laughs> We're sliding in. Yes. We're sliding in. So keep hold, keep the horses reined in, Renata. Um all right, so I'm uh, going to share this. Um, you didn't send this to me, but I found it anyway, just to give context, Linda. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, go ahead and tell us about Miss Sophie. So Sophie Hancock Hobson is my second great grandmother, and we knew very little about Grandma Sophie. Um, she is the mother of seven children. And she was married to Grandpa Mike, who's from uh, Union County, South Carolina. Um, 
if I had to use the census, like this is the 1870 census, it would be the 1880. Um, reason being because it lists the um, place of birth for her parents. Um, and looking for Grandma Sophie, um, couldn't find anything about her. And I go to Mississippi to Chickasaw County every summer and could not find anything on her. One, because the records in the courthouse were burned. So there was nothing to find. Couldn't find her um, in any inventory records. The first time you see Sophie is in this 1870 census and she's already married. And she, as you can see here, she's listed as being 25 years old. I have photographs of all of her children except one, and that's Uncle Curtis. Um, Grandma Sophie, uh, about a year ago, was able to um, come up on, uh, as a result of DNA, her family. So in all this time of, of, of my research, been looking for Grandma Sophie's family, could not find them. Um, and that's a lesson learned. I'll add that right now. Don't just look in the county of where your ancestors live. You got to look at the surrounding counties because that's where I found her family um, in the next county over. Um, how I found Grandma Sophie's family, as I said, um, I saw in Punatok County, which is the next county over from the township where my family was living in Halka was in Punatah County, but I didn't know how they connected. I saw those Hancocks sitting over there. It wasn't until DNA that I was able to make the connection and uh, ultimately find Grandma Sophie's father. Um, taking the 23andMe test, there was a DNA match. Um, her name was uh, Christy. And I reached out to her about a year ago and didn't get a response. So you can't just stop when someone don't respond. What I did was when I looked her up, um, did a Google search. And of course, everyone is on social media of some sort. So I found Christy on uh, um, Facebook. She responded and gave me her whole line. Uh, there was another DNA test came through on Ancestry. And that DNA um, result uh, is the result of Grandma Sophie's brother. I had both of the young ladies to upload their results to Jet Match, and they were even closer to each other than I was. Um, Christie's um, great grandmother and the other DNA match, Pam, her grandfather were siblings. And so as a result of that, um, there were other DNAs. There was a total of eight people out of that Hancock line that have tested. And with the number of us that have tested on our line, they all pointed up to one person. That was Jeffrey Hancock, who was born in 1823 in Georgia. In the 1880 census, Sophie's uh, parents is listed as her father being from Georgia and her mom from Alabama. It looks, um, according to the census record, that Jeffrey um, had um, a total of eight children between three women. And one of the descendants, one of his children's uh, descendants live right here in St. Louis and not too far from me. So we've made connection. So that's what I wanted to share about Grandma Sophie. Um, that was a, a great find for us. And uh, there's a picture that I gave you, Nika, that uh, Christy attended the family reunion uh, this year for the first time. She's a descendant of Grandma Sophie and is her, the connection with her first that I was able to get to uh, Grandpa Jeffrey, who's my third great grandfather. So the lesson learning where you are even if the records are burned down, there's always another way to find additional information. One of the things I also have too is the death records of all of Grandma Sophie's children. Um, and so now I have pictures of even a brother, her brother and one of her nieces. So that's what I wanted to share about Grandma Sophie. Anyone have any questions, comments? Lord, you can hear a pin drop. <laughs> <laughs> so have she? Have you been able to do on-site research? I, I didn't catch that. For the on-site research? Uh-huh. Uh, yes, there was very little information. Sophie was already married. 
-hmm. by the time um, um, I was able to find anything on her. Even the book with her marriage license in it, that would happen to be one of the books that was burned in the courthouse. Okay. So okay. it was it was the result of DNA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All righty. That's Nika. good. That's <laughs> yeah, a I like that. Of like, just, you know, um, when you have a burn courthouse, right? People typically yes. just think, oh, all hope is lost. I can't find anything. I'll never find anything. And the fact that you were still able with DNA as well as other resources mm -hmm. to piece everything back together. So how, how did the, the only question I have is how did you know that? I think you said it was, this, was it Julius? Ju what was this? What was her father's name? Jeffrey. Jeffrey. How, so how did you all know that Jeffrey was her was her father? Was like, her father? Yeah. Because of the connection of the eight people that tested on that line. And they oh. were from different brand, they were from different children um, that were born to Jeffrey. And okay. by by each of those uh, the wives that are I won't say wives, but at least he was married to at least one of them. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm just each of the baby mamas, whoever, <laughs> right? But, yeah, because even still, right? I mean, because because and then th maybe mm -hmm. it was one line had just a little bit more information than another one did, right. and you guys just All picked of, up steam yeah. as you yes. started picking up matches. Okay, see yes. that kind of goes back to of yeah, those right? eight of the of the eight children he had. They're between three women, and they all pointed back up to him. So, mm. so Brand someone, Ike. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> someone, that's what I was gonna say. So someone who was not around when you first started this research had to have had that information. Otherwise, Correct. you it would have been a dead end. So if she did not reach yeah. out to other people, you know, extend a hand, provide what she mm -hmm. knew, provided her intellect, her her DNA. Right. I mean, there's a couple of things. It was right. her research skills, her DNA, what she knew. Mm -hmm. And then they also had to reach back as well. Nobody would have gotten far back and they all wouldn't have been able to reconnect the family. Was this spanning over several states or was this just one location? This was in uh, one location. Of course, they spread out now. And another county I had to look at was Lee County. That's why you can't just stay in your county. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing, too, I have a, a, a well documented tree and so did they and one of the persons that dna tested for one of those branches her name is sophia <laughs> oh and uh -huh. so that was yeah. that was even more of a confirmation uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so that this is a great this is a great example of burned courthouse um still have you know you still have resources reaching out reaching in right and you know the the benefit of doing that is somebody might just have just a little more information than you have um right. that can help propel everybody forward collectively and the fact that you were able to get all these photos along the line too that that's actually yeah. that's actually really awesome all right up next renata um you mm -hmm. let me know when you're ready for your slide to be shown Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about my great grandfather, Calvin Yarborough, and how I discovered that he and my great grandmother were formerly enslaved. So, if you have heard my talk, Finding Calvin, I've been doing for about a year and a half now in different places, you know the whole story. But um, in that talk, it's a case study, and there were two big questions. And the first big question was, was my great grandfather enslaved? I started my research uh, formally around 1997, and I began with Calvin. He was the first uh, suspect, if you want to call him. He was the first ancestor that I um, researched, and it took just short of 10 years for me to get the answer to this question, mostly because um, I was doing local research at the time, you know, hands-on research, all the stuff that's online now was not online. So I had found Calvin in the 1870 through the 1910 census, and I knew about him and his wife, Priscilla. I knew about their 11 children. But, and I suspected that he was enslaved because I had not found him in 1850 or 1860, but I had nothing to prove it until I found this document, which you can go ahead and put up, Nika. And I've shown this on the show for other reasons before, 
Um, but this is the uh, cohabitation record for Calvin and my great grandfather Calvin and my great grandmother Priscilla Shaw um, from Franklin County, North Carolina. And the mistake that I had, I guess if you call it a mistake, I didn't know a lot when I started researching, so I just was figuring things out on my own. And I had been doing most of my work at the county level and had not visited the state archives except one time before I found this. Um, at the county level in Franklin County, um, I don't know if they had the cohabitation records or not, but they are not very uh, interested in um, helping um, with the specifics of African-American research, especially at that time they weren't. And so though I had looked through marriage records and all the big books and everything they had, I had not seen these until my second trip to the North Carolina State Archives, which I think was right at the beginning of 2007. So this is the cohabitation record. Do you have the transcription, Nika? Sure do. Okay, so it reads, before me, T.C. Horton, clerk of the county court for said county, personally appeared Calvin Yarbrough and Priscilla Shaw, residents of said county, lately slaves but now emancipated, who acknowledge that they do cohabit together as man and wife and that said cohabitation commenced 27 December 1860. So um, this was the gold mine for me. Um, it, was, it was heartbreaking in one way because I had to come to the true realization that my great grandparents were enslaved, but it was also a celebration for me um, to have that part of their history and to then know the direction I had to take my research in. Because as I discuss in my talk, once you know that your research goes down a different path than if your ancestors had been free people of color. Um, from this document, I got, um, I had some things highlighted. I, I can't, I can't see if they're highlighted, but I got um, the, I guess we'll call maiden name uh, for Priscilla, which I had never had before this, which, um, has led me to um, further be able to determine who her previous owners most likely were. Um, and I also got um, a, what we'll call a marriage date. Of course, we know slave marriages were not legal, but it lets me know that some kind of ceremony or something had taken place um, on December 27th, 1860. Um, and of course, the key words, lately slaves, but now emancipated, were uh, my confirmation that they had been um, formally enslaved. Um, from here, I was able to uh, start looking for former owners. And um, I think I've talked in a previous show about the the process I went through to do that, because um, I know we're from all over the country and Yarborough might seem like an odd name that you should get lucky with, but Yarborough is a very, very, very common name in Franklin County, North Carolina and throughout North Carolina. So it took a little work, um, but in the talk that I give, I share that I find have found um, the four different owners that Calvin had over the course of his 25 years of enslavement. And there are two blog posts that Nika is going to put in the chat um, where you can read about um, discoveries about Calvin and discoveries about Priscilla. And both of the blog posts link, posts link you back to previous um, posts about them. So I think that's all I had to say. <laughs> All right, opening it up for questions panel. Anybody got any questions, comments? I've heard her talk. It's excellent. And when you did it, was finding the slave owners at Calvin Yarborough, and it was very excellent. She walked through step by step through the process. So reading her um, blog, I saw you put the link in there, I thought. But anyway, it's good to follow that process. And I felt it helped me dig a little deeper to kind of say, let me do the same thing she did. Mm -hmm. Look at what she looked and see if I can find the same thing in Virginia, you know, type mm -hmm. thing. So, good. yeah. Anything else? Nothing? 
Boy, I'm telling you, let me make sure the, the uh, uh, chat room is asking, have you videotaped the presentation, Renata? I have not. I've submitted it for a couple of webinar opportunities, um, so I'm waiting to hear back, but I have not videotaped it. I have thought about it, though. <laughs> I think I have clips and that was it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to be giving it in um, January, at the end of January in Norfolk, Virginia, and on February 23rd in Charlotte, North Carolina. Those are the only two that are lined up right now. But if you're in those areas, um, stay tuned or email me or something and we'll try to get you some information. Let's see. We've got comments from the chat room. Um, Mavis Jones says... Renata's talk on Calvin is excellent. Yeah. Thanks, May. Um, let's mm -hmm. see. Just folks, chat, chat, chatting. Um, I see gonna... Neff Hawth Hawth Hawthorne is saying something about Yarborough from Lincolnshire, England. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've mentioned this before, but my Yarborough line is a unique Yarborough line as far as blood goes. Calvin chose the surname of his last owner, but um, one of the I guess if you want to call it kind of downfalls is that I have not been able to positively identify his siblings or parents yet. Um, I know they did not use the Yarborough surname. I suspect they may have used the Neil surname, but um, I, I, my belief is that he was probably separated from his family. Um, but he took that surname, but he was not born into a Yarborough family. Uh, you know, he wasn't with any Yarboroughs when he was born. He didn't go to a Yarborough till he was uh, 12, 12 years old. So there's no blood connection to Yarborough or the Yarborough name. And all of his descendants, we don't have, so far, I haven't found any other uh, connections to him. So. Okay. All right. Next up is Dr. Shelley Murphy. Hey there, y'all ready? <laughs> I'm getting yeah. ready to take y'all back. <laughs> back to some basics here. And this is why it's kind of critical to go through this um, because we don't want to forget the basics. So yes, my first, my, my point here was to find my third great grandfather in which um, his name is Arnold Warden. He was born in New, uh, Connecticut in 1763. Now, I belong to the Warden Family Association, so I did the due diligence of the typical research. Hit the census, look for you know his service for the military, for the Revolutionary War, so on and so forth. The Warden Family Association, which has probably been around, I think, since the 50s or even the 60s. And they have given two or three different fathers, you know, for my third great grandfather. And so it wasn't what I got from my mom and what she knew, you know, because this is her father's side. And so then as they came up with different names during over the last, say, 25, 30 years, I started investigating and doing my own research. Tip one, do your own research regardless of what somebody else says or what some association says. And again, just like uh, Linda brought out, you know, she had the genealogy research plus the DNA. So anyway, so I started researching and gathering things. And so the Warden, Warden Association finally came up. I've come across three different names that they had. I mean, they came up with three different names. So my goal, again, was to follow my basics. I have my go-to guides. Number one, Tony Burrell's book. Number two, Woodtor's Wood Doors book also. I went back to the bare basics and I had to go local, as you heard um, Bernice mention earlier. So I've gathered all this information. I started with the 1800, 1790 and 1800 census because Arnold Warden was born in 1763 
in Connecticut, New London, Connecticut, or Stonington, Connecticut. And so I researched through that, got his information, tracked him for the Revolutionary War. Arnold ends up dying in 1840 in Petersburg, New York. So I also started tracking using the census. That's our go-to. That's where everybody typically starts, you know, your genealogy research. So I had 1790. So now I was looking at the 1800 census, which Nika, you can put up. And so basically there's Arnold in the 1800 census. He's with a wife and a couple of kids. So I'm able to document what kids are there at that time. My third great grandfather's name is actually Parley. I'm sorry. Uh, second great grandfather's name is Parley. And that's the line I come down there. This warden association has been around probably since the 50s. Uh, matter of fact, I had taken a trip up to the DAR um, library and found the book where the Boyers and the Wardens were. So there's a lot of research on the family. And again, I kept having the problem with them telling me who my third great grandfather was. So that now it's a mission to make sure I can figure this out. And it might have been one of the three that they said. So anyway, so I follow the children of Parley to say maybe there's a connection to Arnold. So I came up, built a tree, did the timeline, you know, all of my typical things that you hear me talking about. Well, after 15 years of research, and I happened to have the chance to go up to New York, to Rensselaer, New York. And I went to the Historical Society because under Parley, the second great grandfather, I noticed the names in the family. There was a Arnold, there was a Abigail, uh, there was a Dudley, and then there was this odd name, Sanford Hewitt. So that's some of Parley's children. I come down from his first, Parley's first son, which is, a, okay, they're born in Michigan. So anyway, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe I've got a thing with the naming patterns. So another tip is to pay attention to find out. So I had to research. Number one, I started with Arnold. What's his name? What's his wife's name? What's his father's name? What's the grandmother's name? So now I have a pattern where I saw Arnold. I saw three Abigails, kind of typical, wasn't there yet. You know, I saw a Dudley, you know, Arnold's brother's name was Dudley. He had, Arnold also had a sister named Abigail, which matched grandmother and great grandmother. And then here we go. There's a neighbor guy, because I researched his military. And guess what his name was? Sanford Hewitt. And I said, oh, wait a minute. That's the same as one of the kids. So I started following that until I got to New York in March, I think it was, this year. I found that the Hewitts were born in Connecticut, in Stonington. I've got, a it's a neighbor, actually, and they're born, his father is born, Sanford Hewitt's father is around the same age as this Arnold that I'm saying is now my third great grandfather. So I pulled pension records on them, Revolutionary War. They were in two battles together per the pension record. And again, this guy that served in the Revolutionary War named his first son Sanford Hewitt. So coming through, visit that historical society in New York, this, that, and the other. And I found that the Hewitts were also in Connecticut. And at the Historical Society, I found out that the Hewitts also were in Rensselaer County after the Revolutionary War. So bottom line was it gave me enough evidence to make a conclusion 
that this man named Arnold was the third great grandfather based on naming patterns, revolutionary war and the connections that they've had. So the bottom line goal was keep to the basics. There's no magic out here. You've got to do the research. Mm -hmm. So that's basically, you know, kind of sums it up and to stay local as mm -hmm. was mentioned earlier. Okay. Yeah. I remember you telling me about Parley's, yeah. uh, the revolutionary war, uh, friend of his, cause you know, I have that file. So I'm always keeping my well, eye out for Parley. And I'm building that proof argument. Cause I have to prove mm -hmm. that this is who his father is, you know, for a lineage society. So the research has gotten extensive, but it's basic. It's not anything magic. I mm -hmm. stuck with census. I stuck with the local records, courthouse, and military. All right. Nika, what you have next, dear? Um, I've got this one more slide for Shelly. Oh, right. that is Arnold, <laughs> my third great grandfather's headstone. He was born 1763. I visited his grave um, when I was there in March, and he died in 1840. I didn't want to throw up my senses and everything where I tracked everybody. So I just put up his headstone. Yeah. <laughs> further, further dispelling the myth that African-American people cannot trace before 1870. All the way back to 1400. I'm on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. It seems like we had a little bit of an outage. We lost some of our viewers. Yeah. Folks were saying that uh, something the connection was a little flaky. I don't know what happened. We've been here, we've been live. So if you happen to yeah. miss something, um, don't forget you all, you can actually go back and rewind as the show is taking place live. And then you can catch up by moving the little circle to the end or just pressing live. Um, so you, you, it, this happens for any show. If you're watching mm -hmm. live and something happens, you lose the connection, whatever, you can always uh, rewind the show while it's taking place. And of course, later on, after we're done, you can rewind it, of course. And um, just in case you missed something that Shelly said. Um, yeah. and Renata also. <laughs> yeah, Renata also. Renata. Yeah, it kind of, it was kind of cutting out. So either way, um, are there any final thoughts that you all have before we go into Ask Mariah that you want to impart to our viewers? Mm -hmm. um, just along the lines of, you know, we're going on hiatus and they're hoping to make some big, gigantic genealogical discoveries and um, just words of wisdom that you would like to give them. I think well, one thing I didn't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> saying keep up with us on the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Renata? I was going to just say it's not about the future. It's, it's about uh, the research to just not limit yourself to one location um, like I did for 10 years staying at the county level with uh, my research, but to you know spread your research out and, and, and your physical presence out as far as you can to where there might be records about your ancestors. Mm -hmm. That, that, oh, that yeah. point hit home a couple of times with you and with yeah. Linda is yeah. the fact that, um, and I, I made sure in the chat, I, I put the mapping episode um, because I think a lot of folks are just, well, my people were from here. Well, what mm -hmm. if the boundary lines changed? What if, you know, and especially talking about slaveholders, what if their slaveholder went from one county to the next or maybe their plantation or the, where they lived straddled both places and in one set of records they're here and one set of records are there, especially when you're dealing with a burned county too. How do you not know that that burned county wasn't the result of a prior county, you know, that where the records weren't destroyed? So, um, yeah, so that's just that to me, I thought that was key, reaching out, reaching in. Um, mm -hmm. making sure you document your, your ancestor stories, um, you know, not focusing just on your direct lines of the family. Anything else before we go into ask Mariah? I was going to say too, uh, if in my case, the courthouse for Chickasaw County, the records uh, were torched, but one book survived mm -hmm. and it was labeled L through M. And I'm glad I didn't make the mistake of thinking that was alphabetical order because it wasn't. And then you're talking about uh, uh, a book that was put together back during slavery. When I looked in that book, it had all kind of information in it that even um, uh, had information that the 
last slaveholders had um, uh, that had my family was in that book. So see what survived. Mm -hmm. So don't just assume everything was burned. See what survived. Yeah. Just keep checking everything. Just like that one episode, we saw the documentary where they had a city directory and it had all that town just had five slave um, people that were selling the enslaved. Yeah, so slave that's trading. how they, yeah. So that's how they found those, um, those names of those slaves in Memphis. And when I was on genealogy roadshow, that's how they found granddaddy Ike's parents. They were over in the next County where I just really wasn't paying attention because I just really thought, you know, he, they were just there. And then they went on to further give me suggestions on what to do about the slave owners. And then that's when I hired Nika on her little thing there who do you work for when you work for janet there um and you're talking you can, about genealogy dot coach yeah so i had to you know hire you for a few minutes to get some coaching in because i was like i had all this stuff sitting here for years and it's like what am i supposed to do with this so mm -hmm. you know you i appreciated that you know your time because i know you're my friend but i know you're still my colleague as well so you gave me suggestions on okay this is what you need to do blah 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 so that's what i've been following up on with that in pike county so i would suggest that as well during the hiatus you all have 30 full days without us a little bit more <laughs> i would suggest partnering with your research buddies have yeah. somebody go over your tree and look for holes in your research, there's absolutely nothing mm -hmm. wrong with having somebody go over mm -hmm. your research just to see maybe there's something you missed. Maybe there's something that mm -hmm. you are taking in stride or you think is not a big deal. And it is to somebody with that doesn't have the same <laughs> eyes, right? It's the same thing as if you're writing a paper and you keep going over it and you're, you know, you're, um, you keep the words seem like everything's fine, but they might find there might be errors, there might be a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's another thing you can do during the hiatus is to um, have someone go over your tree, see yeah. if there are holes or something. I that, swapped that's not files there. with for Victoria Robinson. We both had brick walls, long-term brick walls, and we just turned each other's, each other's files over yeah. to each other. I got Parley, so you know, yeah. I keep an eye out on him as well. Yeah. But. Bounce them off, bounce those ideas off and those thoughts. And what about this? What about that in a timeline? I wish I had that thing about Melvin Collier because he helped me a lot too, where he listed a whole lot of things, just like Shelly's mm -hmm. saying. It's along the lines of timelines where, you know, you look for those un, you know, unusual records that just may be in that location and just try to build build something out of it. Just go by year by year and just keep on going and just don't stop. Don't give up because there's a lot of stuff back here that I thought I'd never get. And it just keeps falling in my lap. Um, well, you just, know, there's yeah. that's a, you're bringing up a great point that we also have to remember, even though we we interact with people, you know, look for the ones that are researching the same areas not necessarily the same surnames that would be good but look for the same people that are researching kentucky or tennessee virginia whatever it is and find out you know yeah i'll try to get facebook that list from moves. Catherine wilson she has over 1300 facebook links to all the yeah, i would yeah we should we should share that that's a great thing for I'll us get to share that on the yeah, facebook page and Twitter. And I, I would add my two cents is that you should be making friends with the people who work at the local archives, mm -hmm. the local libraries. Um, I also have been reaching out to professors who are specialists, let's say in New Jersey. Like I reached out years ago to Graham Russell Hodges. I, you have to make the connections at the local level. Uh, you might, I'm not an expert, you know, I'll, I'll probably be an expert one day, but I'm still relying on other people who have more knowledge than me. So mm -hmm. it doesn't help to to get your name out there um i can't thank my buddy james the librarian at the new jersey historical society we've been working together for 10 years now so i share with him um my aunt god bless her uh all these tin types that are not our immediate family she's given to me and i'll be passing them on to uh james at the historical society they are your friends 
So, so yes. use them. And, and again, it, you know, leave your information behind somewhere. So, so there's a legacy left that people can follow up on your work one day. I would also add to, to join those uh, genealogy societies or historical societies in the counties that you're researching. Sometimes they'll send you information if you can't go there. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Cause they have volunteers. I, I work Albemarle, Charlottesville, Virginia and Fluvanna, Virginia in Loudoun County, Virginia. So anybody out there looking, that's where I typically am at least once a week at one of those places. Great ideas, great ideas. All right, now it's time for your girl. You love her. She's awesome. Her name is Mariah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Yay. the part of the show where you, the viewer, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. And we wait in live with research help specifically geared towards you panelists who never see the queries beforehand. So you get to see, get a chance to see us work together live. Okay. Everybody okay? All right. Got it muted. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to use my controls. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say I'm gonna have to. You gonna have to mute, cause Lord, I Lord, I don't hope somebody ain't fell out of nothing. Like we got to ask Mariah for help. Now let's sit, let's summon the spirits on down to get to head to make sure everybody okay. All right, so you get a chance to see us work out things live. We are the only show like this that offers the public the ability to get research help. Nobody else does this. So stop wishing for Henry Louis Gates, for long lost family, for who do you think you are to help regular people. We help regular people here at Black Pro Gen Live. We've been doing it for more than a year, for two years. Yes, give the panelists, think about that. We did 27 episodes just this year. We helped 27 different people just this year. So be sure to check the link in of every description of Black Pro Gen Live. That's how you can um, uh, submit. Oh, there's an interesting question in the chat room. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to current events, but Nev Hawthorne, asked a very interesting question. Um, we'll have to follow up on that. All right, so tonight's query is from Melanie Gerald. She says, my great, great, great grandmother was enslaved and had a child, Ellen Adeline Carmichael, born in 1844 with Archibald Carmichael. So we've got a third great grandmother, enslaved, had a child named Ellen Carmichael with a man named Archibald Carmichael. The third great grandmother was born in 1790 in North Carolina. She is listed as Slave Carmichael. So we've got an approximate birth uh, date and name, right? An associated name. But Melanie also says, how can I find her name and where she is from? So she says that she's noted as Slave Carmichael, born 1790 in, in uh, North Carolina, but she does not have a name for her. Now she says that Ellen, um, became Ellen Gerald, and she has her in the census um, with a child named Gussie Goff as a child. So uh, these, this is the preliminary information that she has. Third grade grandmother she's looking for, born approximately 1790, North Carolina. Um, no name for her. She wants to know how she can find the name and where she is from. I guess that's specifically where she is from. And that her Ellen, who's the daughter of her third great grandmother, her second great grandmother, is known as Ellen Gerald. Um, and that she's on the census um, with Augusty Goff as a child. Next slide. This information could assist with other family members as Archibald and his wife moved to Mississippi and had seven to eight children who all died young. Some lived and married and had other children, and this connection could explain the 1,200 white, quote, unquote, cousins. So this sounds to me like Archibald was the slaveholder. That's the way that this reads, that Archibald Carmichael was the slaveholder of Ellen and her mother, and that he was also Ellen's father, and that Melanie has a large number of cousins who do not racially identify the same as her through uh, 23andMe um, Ancestry DNA as well as GEDmatch. So here's the question. How can Melanie discover the name of her unknown third great grandmother? Well, 
Well, somebody has to say something, so I will. They do, and I was going to, but I, and I know we're all we're all we're all saying what we're going to say because my my thought process is, yeah. How do you know Slave Carmichael is her? Right, and and number one, I would probably start current and go back with the timeline type thing, you know, so she can walk steps. Cause if she can find her up at the end, <laughs> you know, and then start walking back because, you know, when we do that slave research and Linda alluded to this or, or Renata, someone don't stay in the same place. It might be the next County, this, that, and other. If you're dealing with slave research. You need to do the bullseye the type thing and hit the middle where you think they are and then start circling around, you know, and hitting all the counties, you might even cross into another state, depending. So I would probably start setting up that research plan on the questions that I had, just as you just pointed out. I would also look at the uh, her children if they died after uh, when uh, death records were mandatory are made available look and see how she was listed on her children's death records and place of birth yeah that's a great one because that alludes to when she was saying about the golf mm -hmm. and i think it was some other surname she needs to uh eliminate that one you know right. yeah and i think neff um posted in the chat room nika did you see that she said there's a picture of Ellen Adline. Oop, you just moved it. It moved. Ellen Adline Carmichael in Ancestry with a birth date of 1844. And I also didn't hear anywhere she talked about on the slide. Wasn't there something about, was it Mississippi or something? Yeah. I didn't yes. know location. Or, you know, so again, I think that timeline to get that basic stuff back there, um, she needs to settle kind of the area, you know, and they probably know it just didn't, you know, put it in the write up, but something else was listed. So North Carolina, I think it was. That was the first, but then she said something. Oh, how, how can she find where she's from? Yeah. Yeah, this looks like this is uh this is Melanie's tree. Um that's got the image of uh okay. Ellen attached to so it. That's and it this so. is and here's the thing, bright shiny objects. Yes, we care about the photo, but this ain't her mama name ain't embroidered on that dress in this picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, Gerald Miller saying yes. was there a cohabitation or a marriage record? Yeah, that's a great that's a great um because of north carolina like we're not yeah and then check the freedman bureau records yeah um oh, that's she got a, you know what ellen this alleged picture ellen, ellen got a nice natural in this photo because <laughs> i'm over here talking about her natural is together y'all look Ooh. oh yeah yeah her, her natural is 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 all right now here's the thing we talked about working in concert with other people tonight right Yes. That's one of the things we talked about. So, so this is Melanie's tree. I found Melanie's tree on Ancestry. And she saved this image from someone named Blair Goff. That's the same oh. last name as mm -hmm. the child who was on the census with mm -hmm. Ellen. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do is if I notice that I find somebody who is working on the same family, an yeah. easy cheat is see how it says link to here and let me zoom in because you know i know angela be talking about me if stuff be too small um zoom in here to to this i zoom in i'm zooming in but go go here and see what they have on their tree right mm -hmm. now here's now here's the thing you can oh, go see. back right you go back um and actually that was yours but look at where it says it's saved by right you want to pay attention to yeah. these people this is who it's linked to on the tree that you're on. But if you want to go back to the origin person, look for their profile picture. So what what does what does Blair what does this Blair Goff tree? What is this? Right? Who is it? Who who do we have? Right? Mm -hmm. Search for the folks in here. 
and pay attention to those other surnames that that are listed. You know, we all know a golf. I don't know if she has Jen. roots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Genealogy, Jen. Jen is yeah. a golf, and I don't know if her line is is towards the south. Don't know. But I couldn't checking. remember if she had slavery or not. But there's also well, that button about finding finding your or others that are researching. Yeah, um, yeah. and here's the that here's button. the thing. This is this, and so here's there's a difference between Melanie's tree and this person's tree. Yeah. And if you have and if you haven't noticed it, sourced. you should notice it on the onset. Oh, it's sourced. Carolina. It's sourced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's number one. one. The, it, every other tree we've saw has had ancestry family, family trees. trees. Yes, that's mm -hmm. nice, but we mm -hmm. want to see census see records, that. right? Yes. And so, yeah. where where is Blair getting this information about this slave? Mm -hmm. How does she know that that's all she's got? This is the primary source she's got the slave schedules. And how do we know that this is the right person? How do we know she's born in North Carolina in 1790? How do we know this? The slave schedules is a census of for the slaveholder. It's not for the enslaved because there are no names. It's blank. So how do we know that this is the same person unless there's oral history? Maybe is there a note? Or, yeah, right? I don't see or a will notes. and inventory records. Yeah, the, but there, none of that is attached here. There's nothing right. in the gallery no, because, other than yeah. the slave schedules. Okay, so how do we know that Archibald is her father now you've got a archibald he's in clark county mississippi how Probably do we go different. from north carolina to mississippi that's a big jump mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we yeah. haven't i don't even see proof that ellen was even owned by this man because right. there's no notes or anything and that's, there's another, no notes. that's a lot there's of people no to go through on that 1850 to go through all their probates and find out if they died between this and that yeah now, see here, here notation. under this, right? You under mm -hmm. the notations, you've got property sold. So clearly, mm -hmm. there is there's been some on site or mimicking on site research because yeah, you've but got they're not this, researching a slave there. No, that's, that's what I'm saying. But yeah. that, that means that she's that somebody's gone local. So they're yeah. been so, aware of going on site and. You know, like I do that for Granddaddy Ike. Sometimes I may not put the photo up there, but I'm telling you what he got the land in 1912, you know, and go into detail there. But I see what she's doing. I can, yeah, I, so yeah, this is which is gonna take her different ways because if you look at that, those facts should be facts for Ellen Carmichael, and they're not. The, no, they are because no, look at the date. all that, yes, like they you're are. telling me that look slave the bought all that property. No, Look at this, 1908. 1908. This he is after sold slavery. It. Sold mm -hmm. to P.S. Gerald, 150 acres. How did she get it? Right? Mm -hmm. So, so y'all are saying that Ellen Carmichael is the one that sold Gerald the land. Based off of, based off of this, it's saying sold to P.S. Gerald, 150 acres, $45, estate land of Alfred Gerald. That's my question. See, I don't what think so. Alfred, Look at the next one. By way of Gussie Goff, deeded to C.A. Gerald Estate Lands. So this looks she like this is the same so thing. So we got another Carmichael Gerald at? down here. So that's what I'm saying. So where's the Carmichael? Where does yeah. that fit? Okay, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah we're saying the same thing. So how, how do we know there's a Carmichael? All we see in these local records are mm -hmm. Gerald's. So how do the Gerald's, so where did Carmichael come from? I don't see a death record on here. Right? What does she have for 1870? She's got her under Gerald. Ah, maybe. Well, then there's and and there was parents on there too. Um, with this one on the 1870. View. Yeah, household look down. members. Ho well, household members. There's a daughter, Sarah, and I don't know if that's a brother or a husband in 1870. This would be a child and and a husband. And there's okay. other people in the household here. Oh. Okay. Or, you know, I mean, uh, next door that are Gerald's. Mm -hmm. Can you go back one census, one page to the left? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, go back and see down at the bottom if there's more Gerald's. Yep. yep. Here's another one. 
So Alfred, Alfred might be the head of that house. And why does he look white from here unless my eyes no, are... No, it's black. No, it's black. It's black. It's black. Okay. It's black. Go okay. to bed, True. Go to bed. I'm <laughs> still hanging. I Land. saw that middle one and I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think... I think yeah. this is a matter of um, I, this is a, this is a reach out to reach in. Honestly, mm, yeah. I think she needs to reach out to Blair, find out what information Blair has because Blair's tree is sourced, and in order to get this particular name, there's a number, there's a there's a certain amount of due diligence that needs to be done with with verifying slaveholdership because we just don't have based off of these little crumbs that we have there's nothing here substantial that says that Ellen was a Carmichael how do we know that right. i'm not seeing a death record um i'm not seeing um unless we have to go to her children and maybe hope that they maybe have a social security um you know applications index that mentions the name um mm -hmm. i'm looking I'm, let me see there's a death certificate here for one of the children and the children are sourced actually seems like pretty well um in these trees um this is and interesting it, and neff also posted that blair's linked to the halbert carmichael tree so uh those two probably know each other somewhat and um it seems they, like she's keeping a detailed record and that she knows where she tested and her Excel, she, she's probably getting all those other golf matches. Cause if she's doing her tree like that, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's working on her DNA the same way and trying to, you know, get all that narrowed down on that Excel sheet about who, you know, where they're all matching at all the names of places and locations. Mm -hmm. So I think that would help her too, you know, collaborating with that. Just try to focus on it like I do with the ivories or just a little project that we, when they come mm -hmm. in, they go on the Excel sheet. Well, and, and you're bringing up another good point because you mm -hmm. could see that her tree, at least Blair's, had a lot of information. And sometimes you got to start small and then creep to that other information. Mm -hmm. The process sure of you got, yeah, a clear mm -hmm. understanding, analyzing what you have. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got all those senses, but we already came up with questions that we're not seeing responses there. Mm -hmm. You have to resolve those things too. And, yeah. and if we're missing that, you know, just like Nika, I think her first thing said, well, what does she have that proves she's a slave? Mm -hmm. you know something i mean that right off the bat would be a, a great question but again i would probably start at the 1870 maybe and go back or even go you know into the 1900s because it just might be somebody's death certificate of one of these kids or something that's going to lead and, and them look, back i just looked through her children and all the death records that are attached at least to blair's tree yeah. don't list her don't aren't for her chill ellen's children okay they're for her grandchildren which mm -hmm. of course would not list her maiden name Correct. or her name on them so there goes there and still there goes back to my question how do we know that ellen's surname is carmichael how do we know mm -hmm. that where, mm -hmm. where did that information come from is it oral history that still has to be rectified how do we know that archibald carmichael was her slaveholder and that he was her father. How do we know that? And Correct. further, the other piece with this too, is if you're going to try to vet Archibald Carmichael, you need to do the appropriate genealogy research on yes. his family specifically. Where were mm -hmm. they? Where were they living? Have you looked at the state inventories? Have you looked at deed records at the local level that may list the names of Ellen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whatever the woman's name was and her increase or and child Ellen. And then that would that would give you the circumstantial proof. But at this point, using a slave schedules, we talked about this ad nauseum, that yeah. is not circumstantial proof that that was a slaveholder. That's why we're doing that, that 1B, because mm -hmm. we have folks that are struggling once they get back to the slave part, you know, that we can give them some strategies and things, you know, there could, how many other slaveholders is in that county mm -hmm. you know they could pull up because typically they're connected too yeah. and so now we got two different names for her carmichael and then the golf or 
or Gerald or whatever it was. So mm -hmm. that could have changed in 1870 or before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I just I have a lot of questions and this is where this is where you you message Blair and any other person yeah. that you saw that had attached that photo to their tree mm -hmm. and ask them um you know how they fit in, what information mm -hmm. they have and you've got you know you've got two great locations to do research. Um you know, for this this particular family, North and South Carolina are are great. Mississippi records are wonderful, but you've got to go local there. You can't expect yes. to find a lot online. I mean, yes, when it comes yes. to deed records and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. um, you know, going back, um, you know, uh, to death certificates and stuff like that, you you just you just can't have an expectation that you're going to get that stuff online for, um, for Mississippi. It's definitely, um, it's definitely local. So, yeah. um, yeah, vet vetting Archibald Carmichael as a slaveholder and a father is key. Um, and following that enslaving family and tracing their ancestry and their documents is, is yeah. where the information is at. And even, even on Blair's tree, which is great and which is nicely sourced, um, it does have that Archibald Carmichael was born about 1790 in North Carolina and died in Clark County, Mississippi in 1850. Um, the reason why this is key, and I'll, I'll do a share screen again, and we've talked about this a hundred times. I'm going to keep talking about it um, because I don't think enough people are paying attention. Um, not enough people know on Family Search to go to the catalog yeah. and um, and look at records that way. Um, We've been so spoiled. <laughs> we, we have been. Well, and I keep, and, I keep, and we got to use them. Because yeah. this is, if, if you're, see, here's the thing. Here's Archibald's page, okay? She's got an 1850 census on him, mm -hmm. 60 years old, North Carolina, Clark County, Mississippi, okay? Mm -hmm. If we click on that, let's see what it's talking about. What's the real estate? What's the personal estate, okay? He's listed in a household with a man with $100 worth of real estate. That's There's not that sizable. That's not, that's not, that's There's not that sizable Anderson for name. Anderson Here. is in the same household, and that was on the other stuff that you showed on Ancestry. Anderson? Isn't that Carmichael is up in the Isn't that William Anderson? The house no. he's in? Archibald Carmichael, who's a, oh, allegedly, Carmichael. The father, okay. allegedly the father and the slaveholder. That's, that's what is being alleged. Here. But what's the first name at the top there? William, William Anderson. Yeah, okay. We don't, yeah. Yeah, we don't know we don't know anything about him. So here and yet again, search to go. not go here. Don't stop stop this. Don't go here. Go. The average person is going to go there because this is easy. This is easy. This but let me show you how you get to the people. Go to catalog. catalog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Clark. We're looking for Clark County, Mississippi. We're gonna click search. What do they have? This was a county created in 1812. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is our early Mississippi County. We're gonna go over here to land and property. Go to deeds. What is digitized? Oh, look, we've got stuff from 1856 to 1873. Right. So this looks like there might have been some records destruction or they didn't allow them to to us uh, to to microfilm everything because I'm not seeing things from 1812. I'm seeing the earliest stuff I'm finding is from 1856. But that does not mean that you shouldn't look for Carmichael's in this index. What do we mean? Like, by I, that? Say, like, yeah. like I, I said, yeah, like I said, go, was... go here. Just just a second. Go mm -hmm. here. OK, mm -hmm. you're going to go through this index. You're going to mimic the on site research process. What do I mean by that? This is the index that tells you which book and which page you need to go to. So right. we're, and this is my cheat. I'm giving you guys my cheat. A, see how there's a blank. B, blank. C, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, look, we're at C's. You're gonna scan this index for Carmichael's. Doesn't matter who it is, right? Yeah. It's gonna give you the book and the page, mm -hmm. book, page, and the parties who were involved. You're, they're going to take this. Let's say hypothetically, this is C271. Go back here. 
C where it says deed book B. Yes. And C, right? Mm -hmm. Go here. Camera. Okay, to the camera. And we know we know that this is several books in one. We want to make sure we're on the right one. So this is deed record A. We want C. Okay. There are 600 images in here. You got to let all of them load until you can get to book C and mm -hmm. then find page 371 or whatever the page is. This is how you get to this information, you all. And I'm, I'm saying this ad nauseum because we're getting ready to go on hiatus. But this is how you're going to find these people. They are not going to jump out at you because you put in a search here. There are millions of people hiding in this catalog and folks are too lazy or they don't know to come in here and to look. Mm -hmm. The other piece is if you're on Ancestry and we've got an alleged death date of 1850, just come mm -hmm. up here to search. You know, you can do people realize you can search directly from a profile page. There, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. We've got 2000 records. Here's a tree where someone else is researching this family, right? How do we know that this guy, look at this, way more census records. How do we know that he died in Ooh, 1850? passenger and immigration. And he says DNA too. Stuff. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. Archibald mm -hmm. Monroe Carmichael, death date 1844, Clark County. It's got the list of names. It says find a grave. Okay. All right. If that's the case, there should be a probate record for him. He died before the Civil War ended. What does that mean? That means that there was a probate generated. If he had any property and he owned any people, those names are going to be listed on an inventory. Where do you find the inventory? On the catalog on Family Search. We just yeah. took you there. So, <laughs> sorry for folks and for that this was yeah. a review, but this is, this is for her. So, you understand, mm -hmm. you can't just expect to put a name in a box. Linda, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I forgot. No, I was just going to say, <laughs> don't assume that uh, a book doesn't have that information in it. You, you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and get to work. Yeah. Because some of those pages, mm -hmm. you have to go page gonna, by page. You got to look at yeah. them. And yeah. And don't forget, I if you're in Mississippi, yeah. in Mississippi, don't forget the planter's mm -hmm. records. The, free, yes. uh, the Freedmen's records that and those are on the Mississippi website too. The uh, you're talking about our MDA? website. You're talking about uh, yeah, uh, the MDA. archive MDA. Which, MDA. Which, which, yeah, Ms. MDA, which I will be there on yeah. Friday. So excited <laughs> for that. Um, she's talking about MDA, which is uh, the Mississippi Archives website. I'll share that so you guys can see it. Uh, me and Linda are our sisters in one in Mississippi because nobody mm -hmm. else reaches but us. <laughs> I <laughs> do Lauderdale, Mississippi. Well, you know, Mr. from there. Alabama. Right yeah, so, so th th this website is deceiving because it doesn't look very search friendly. But you yeah. want to go to, they have a whole genealogy section. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they've got all the different little records that they have. And like I said, it's not the most friendly, but they've got the labor contracts, other stuff that's on here. Also, Family Search has this stuff. But going back to this catalog, right? We went to land and property, go to probate mm -hmm. records, right? You mm -hmm. want to see what they have. Court minutes, right? Remember, he died allegedly 1844. That covers mm -hmm. that time period. You've yeah. also got this one here. You've also got this one here. Remember, just because he died in 1844 does not mean that his probate was automatically just completely finished that year. It may have been, it may have taken time. And I, I, I really think we're almost giving her um, like a check because you looked at that 1850, he had no property. How is that? He had nothing. So if he owned her as an enslaved person and then she was brought to, to from North Carolina or South Carolina with money. him. Yes. How did he not, if he was her slaveholder, how was she not listed as his property in 1850? That's right. That, that doesn't quite jive with the story. Unless so, he got her later in 1850 after the census was done, then she needs to go find where that tax money where he had yes, to pay and there are by the end going of the back, year. Yes. Going back to MDA. There yeah. are tax receipts for every county yeah. on the website from the Mississippi State Archives, Mississippi Department of Archives and History. That's why we keep saying yeah. MDA. Okay. So, yeah, you, Melanie, you got homework for, uh, and, and I see the <laughs> chat room is saying they have homework too. I, yeah, I, I yeah feel but look like, at Marion. <laughs> Marion said, know. this is like going to the courthouse from your recliner. Child, <laughs> yes, Marion. And let me tell you, let me tell you guys, how do you think I have more than 50 transactions of that exactly. enslaved group 
of people is because I went through the catalog and I went yeah. through deep books and I went through probates. Yeah. That's the way I got to that stuff. It was not because I searched for it on a box. It was not because the inventory was digitized on Ancestry and I clicked the link. Right. No, uh, you have to go the hard way. So, uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Melanie, you got homework. So does the rest of the chat room. This is probably the 10th time we've done that exercise, but I'll yeah. continue to do it because I feel like not enough people are taking advantage of this digitized microfilm at all. Now, and, don't, do and don't forget Chronicling America. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, if you the do newspapers. run into... The in, if you did run into the situation where you do see a camera and there's a lock icon or a key icon, you do have to be at the Family Search Center or at a Family mm -hmm. Search Library in order yeah. to be there. You have to be at one that is in a Mormon church. You can't be at one of the satellite uh, locations mm -hmm. um, because they don't have access. Um, the same with the Family History Centers do that are within a Mormon church. But if it just has that camera and I know that all the Mississippi has it because I've been looking there. <laughs> And it's free 99 now. You better take your behind on that catalog. I'm playing with y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get a cup of coffee and just get ready to go to work. Get, for real. Yeah. Stay up all night. Matter of fact, matter well, of fact, I, let me come off. Let me come off of here. I want a report from everybody in the chat room. Yeah. On what you found using the catalog. Not search. Not search. Using the catalog and digitized records that are on family search. What did you find that was not already digitized? It was not indexed. I want to report. You got 30 days. Make our mentions expand on Twitter, on Facebook. Matter of fact, true, start a thread on our Facebook page. Yes. And put, <laughs> what did you find by going through the catalog on family search? That Go. will help so much. Yes. <laughs> All right. I, I can't tell you the last time I clicked search. I, I just I just don't I never sure go there. But I have used it in years. I, I haven't anyway. either because I'm like I'm like Hassani, I love you, boo, but I'm gonna need you. You're not gonna get any sleep tonight. Those of you who all 61 of you guys watching live, you are not getting any sleep. I have messed up your life. Call, tell your spouse, I'm sorry, yes. boo. Nika did it. Blame it on me. It is yeah. okay. Go get your get your cup. Okay, get your glasses. Here we go. Okay, we about to be in here live, looking through the catalog, getting all of our research life. I'm gonna mess up your 30 days because yeah. there's there are millions, you guys hear me, millions of our ancestors hiding on this site and people are too lazy. Mm -hmm. Get your pad out all, because you'll I have to mark it, that page I where think you left more off. more so they don't know how to, to actively use the the website mm -hmm. and use those tutorials, use that kind of stuff and share the information. I think people, and maybe, <laughs> maybe this is something that I set up a really quick YouTube yeah. just to get to, because, you know, I know family search, like, I mean, do they not have a tutorial on how to use the catalog? I, yeah, maybe they I'm don't. I'm pretty sure they do. I think they do too, but I think I think we think our folks just aren't in these records. It's the same thought process yeah. as, mm -hmm. you know, why would you go look locally because your folks are not there? That's not true. You've no. seen time and time and time and time we're again there. tonight that, that we're there and that we're documented. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mar uh, Marion says maybe we can do a session on key index system that some counties use for probate records. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because each county is different and um, we probably need to, that, that needs to be, um, well, we, I think we have a research trip episode that we're talking about doing for 2019. So that would that would kind of fall in there with how you search on site, prepare, do all that kind of stuff, I think. But anywho, all right, let's get to current events because this is time to go. It's time to go. All right. Yes, we're celebrating. Woohoo! French President Emmanuel Macron on Friday agreed to return 26 cultural artifacts to Benin without delay a move that could put pressure on other formal colonial powers <coughs> uk <coughs> <coughs> all right now <coughs> us return your stuff to first nations people uh, a move that could put pressure on other formal colonial powers to return african artworks to their countries of origin the decision 
which Macron said should not be seen as an isolated or symbolic case, came as the president received the findings of a study he commissioned on repatriating African treasures held by French museums. Macron agreed to the return of 26 works, mainly royal statues from the palaces of Abomey, formerly the capital of the Kingdom of Dahomey, taken by the French army during the war in 1892. <laughs> this is not this is not during the transatlantic slave trade this is 1892 mm -hmm. and now paris Kwai, and and they're now in paris's Kwai branley museum here's the thing oh let me finish reading this because i got a lot to add to this in addition he proposed gathering african and european partners in paris next year to define a framework for quote ex an exchange policy for african artworks the president quote hopes that all uh, possible circulation of these works are considered returns, but also exhibitions, loans, and further cooperations, at least uh, Palace said. Osman Olegidi, uh, director of the Benin Cultural Center, Artistic Africa, said he was pleased to see a new form of cultural exchange with France. Britain has also faced calls to return artifacts, including the uh, Elgin mar marbles uh, to Greece and the Benin bronzes to Nigeria, while museums in Belgium and Austria house tens of thousands of African pieces. And this is just something that's interesting because the, this news came down people were saying well they should leave it in France because you know they just can't take care of it that's not true there is an entire museum of the kingdom um, in Abomey I have been there they have relics there that are three times as old as this stuff they have all of literally all of the thrones of the last like 15 before the monarchy was ended uh, kings there so to assume that people can't take care of their own stuff is just asinine and further if they decide they want to put, literally light a match to it and throw it up in flames because they want to, they can. It's, it's their theirs. stuff. That's right. So uh, I highly suggest if you ever go to Benin, definitely go to Abomey. Visit the kingdom. It's amazing. I was just there in April. Um, and I hope other countries um, follow suit with this. Um, also, uh, 50 years ago, Berkeley High students won, went on a successful strike to demand the creation of the first African-American studies department at a high school. Half a century later, it remains the only such department in existence. Can you believe that? There is no other African-American studies department at a high school in the United States. That's a shame. Outside of Berkeley High School in Berkeley, California. Last week, during a multi-day 50th anniversary extravaganza, the teenagers enrolled, currently enrolled in the Afro-Haitian dance and Afro, uh, excuse me, African-American English courses. Yes, they do have an African-American English course. Got to learn about the legacy of their department. <coughs> Steve Wasserman, publisher at Heyday, uh, reminisced about creating the department with his late friend, Ronnie Stevenson. Stevenson was a young member of the Black Panther Party and the founding chair of the Berkeley High Stu Black Student Union. And he remained a local community leader until his death in 2010. I argued, how can you consider yourself an educated student if you only knew the speeches of Abraham Lincoln and you didn't know the writings of Frederick Douglass? To our astonishment, the school board agreed to our demand. In the fall of 1968 uh, protests, the students also successfully got the district to hire more black teachers to work in the department, then called Black Studies. Richard Navies oversaw the operation <laughs> for years. It is now headed by Naomi Washington. Deal. To this day, the program offers courses as varied as African American journalism, Black psychology, and Swahili. This is crazy that this is the only program like this in the United States. In 1969, Wasserman, who was who is white, he's white, and he's the one that called for this program, was able to enroll in the first African American history course ever offered, and together with his peers, began publishing an underground newspaper, The Pack Rat, which Black Panthers co-founder Bobby Seale let the students typeset at their party's headquarters. Wow, crazy. All right, here's your reminder. Don't forget, while you're on the hiatus especially, be sure to visit us on Facebook, like the page, you'll be able to follow. We also are gonna want your book reports as comments on what you found in the catalog section of the uh, Family Search website. Be sure to tune into the long running, run, sorry, long running research at the National Archives of Beyond, hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Bernice Bennett. Thursday, December 6th, the topic is Unearthing the Story of Henry Book, Bookhart, Brookhart. Bernice welcomes Christopher Smothers for an interview about a heart wrenching story about Henry Brookhart, the man who was beaten, lynched, and survived during the 1876 election season in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana. Future episodes also include Census Department of the South with Yvonne C. Emanuel on Thursday, December 13th, 
and an episode on Thursday, December 20th with yours truly, where I discuss my ties to James Alexander Ventress, the namesake of Ventress Hall at the University of uh, uh, Mississippi, also known as Old Miss Campus, who was also a slaveholder and owned my family. All shows air 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Also check out the African Roots Podcast hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. Visit AfricanRootsPodcast.com for her episode archive. And after 27 episodes, we are officially done with season four of Black Pro Gen Life. It's been an amazing year. We are so grateful for you spending more than a day of your life with us talking genealogy and family history with seasoning. Stay tuned for the forthcoming release of season of the season five schedule and more. We hope to get it out next week. We've got to meet and finalize our selections. Um, so you should be hearing from us next week with regard to the season five schedule. During the hiatus, be sure to be on the lookout for updates through our social media channels and to view the episode archives. All right, true. I'm going to go ahead and over and pass it over to you to do your salutations. <laughs> thank you, Nika. <laughs> I'm not going to hit it long. I just want to thank everybody out there for supporting us all season long. And we're just looking forward to 2019. Um, send your friends and families over to us, to all the panelists. Thank you for everything you've done this season. Um, me and Nika really appreciate it all. So we just want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And we'll see you guys in 2019. <laughs> So good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Black Progen Live. Black Progen Live. Black Progen. Hello, everybody out there. Black Progen Live. Black Progen Live. The unapologetic black and people of color viewpoint. The place where evidence tells the story.